Next up is Dr. Dong Cha. Dong is a research biologist here at PBARC, and we're really happy to have him. He's been with us, what, about three years now? Okay, great. Um, Dong is from Seoul, Korea originally, but he's been um, in the States for quite some time getting both his bachelor's and master's in forest resources. Oh, well, that was at Seoul National University, but he got his PhD in forest research resources from Penn State University. Um, so he brings a plant background to entomology, which is really great for us. Um, so he has done postdocs at Cornell and also a, a postdoc with USDA ARS in Washington State. Um, here at PBARC, he serves as our ornamental crop entomologist with expertise in chemical ecology, which involves, you know, how do we develop attractants and deterrents for pests. Um, and his um, research program here is to investigate both pre- and post-harvest treatments of major pests of ornamental crops here in Hawaii. So, aloha, Dong. Okay. Thank you. My voice is a little strange because I'm having, seems like having colds. But uh -oh. <coughs> so, this morning I will talk a little bit about our uh, grant aid project that we've been working on two and a half years, supported by HEFNA and HDOA uh, to develop a systems approach to reduce uh, rejections of the ornamental crop exports from Hawaii. So basically, this has five objectives, uh, working with four growers to develop systems approach for lower rejection and inform those information to the growers and also industry so they can use the tools and resources. And finally, do the survey with the growers to find out if there's an increase in the confidence for the reduced, achieving the reduced rejections. <clears throat> so when I mention the systems approach, this is basically what all the growers are already doing, so combination of different pre- and post harvest treatments to get the pest-free product. So it would be nice to just use single treatment and get the pest-free product, that, but that's not possible. And, and that's why we are using, trying to use the systems approach. So fortunately, Dr. Arnold Hara already developed a lot of uh, these uh, pre- and post-harvest treatments. So the rationale for this project initially was to overview all like available treatments and, and, and formulate a systems approach for different crops and test if there's the, I enough to get the pest-free product or not. And if it's not, we can think about some different <coughs> treatments. So to do that, we initially looked at uh, five-year rejection data we got from APHIS uh, from 2012 and 16, and you can see that there's a cut flower and foliage and orchid rejections of a totaling about 1,300 over five years. And this table shows uh, all the pests that, uh, that created rejection. By sorted by the number of the rejection caused by each pest. And you can see that uh, the top six pests accounted about 80% of the rejections. Uh, those are the scary insects, mealybug, ants, and aphid, and slugs, and thrips. And theoretically, if you control this 80% effectively, you can reduce the uh, rejection rate quite low. And that's about one rejection per grower per year, which is fine for the, in terms of the exportation. So, so we want to control those uh, six pests first. And this one rejection per grower per year is kind of a little bit misleading, so I will go back to that at the end of my talk again. So for cut flowers, you can see that there's a scale, mealybug, ants, and aphid, most problem causing interceptions, and for those insects, generally ginger and heliconia are most susceptible. So we've decided to focus on ginger and heliconia for this insect pest, uh, for, for cut flower for this insect. For foliage, uh, scales and mealybugs are most problem, and you can see that tea and palm and dracaena leaves are probably most susceptible. And orchid, it was mostly about the thrips, and especially the melon thrips. 
and those are on the dendrobium. So we focus our effort on this, but the rejection data doesn't uh, distinguish uh, the, if the, the rejections are from the potted plants or the cut plants. So we did actual some, we actually did some surveys uh, with the growers and confirm that uh, these pests are indeed problem on these uh, uh, flowers and leaves. And we recruited four growers, so one uh, cut flower grower, one foliage grower, and two orchid growers, and each was paired with the one shipper. And those were the Greenpoint and the Pacific Flora Exchange. So I asked uh, Arnold, Dr. Arnold Hara and got the treatment suggestions. Uh, for pre-harvest treatments, it was mostly chemicals. So for mealybox and scale and insect and aphid, we used marathon, safari, and contos. And for ants, we used probate, tango, extinguish plus, and slug was methaldehyde, and thrips were, uh, growers were already using many, many different kinds of pesticide in different rotations. So we just uh, used based on that. For post-harvest treatment, uh, generally washing and hot water treatment for cut flower and foliage, there's currently no generally used post-harvest treatment for thrips, uh, for orchid. Yeah. So one thing I want to uh, point out is if you see there's a, for hot water treatment, there's a like this specific like temperature and time specified. That's because there's not much, there's not very many like wiggle room there. So you can increase like temperature like to, to 30 and increase the time to like 10 minutes and you will get better control of the insects. But <clears throat> that will also induce like severe, more severe phytotoxicity. So that is not uh, like suitable. So there's not much wiggle room, and that's why we want to use the systems approach because if that uh, post harvest treatment is has 99% efficacy of killing insects, and if you have 100 insects after your pre-harvest treatment, and then if you treat with that post harvest treatment, you still have maybe one insect alive, right? So that's not for good for the, the inspection. So. So, so that's why we want to use systems approach to lower down the insect level as much as possible with, with using the different treatments. So, so I will talk about the survey data from now. So this is the ginger and heliconia field. It looks very clean from the outside, but if you look at very close closely, it's infested with many different things. So there's a scales and mealybugs and aphid and ants. And this particular grower uh, didn't use pesticide and they were only, only using the post-harvest treatment. So for that, after harvest, they uh, wash flowers using hand with soapy water and then the flowers shipped to the uh, shipper, delivered to the shipper, and there it was treated with the hot water treatment and, and second wash with uh, like uh, high pressure wash. So to see if the only this post-harvest treatment protocol systems approach works for to clean the clean product, we did the survey in between every steps and see the pest level on the plants. And in the field, the ginger and heliconia was 100% infested. And after harvest, uh, it's, uh, the grower kind of removes all the like leaves and cuts some stems, so that reduced, but still it was 99%. And, 84% ginger and heliconia was infested. And this is the 2017 survey data when there's no insecticide was used. So at the post-harvest time, there's a infestation on the plants. There's an aphid and mealybox, high number of the aphid and mealybox, and some ancient scales. And you can see after first wash, the numbers uh, decreased a lot, but still it's not complete. And if you see the stems, there's a still 69 and 56% of ginger and heliconia has insect, some insect on it. And after the hot water treatment and wash, it decreased more, but still about 24% and 8% had the, the insects on the, on the flowers. And 
basically at this point all the insects were dead except one aphid which is so one aphid alive so which is not good for the inspection it will get rejected so in 2018 and 19 we uh, recommended some pesticide so this is a 2018 data before pesticide treatment so x-axis is the different insects so aphid millibus scale and ant y-axis is the number of these insects on each flower and this is averaged over uh, ginger and heliconia this time and the first bar is the before wash it and first and the second bar is the after first wash and third bar is the after hot water and treatment and second wash and generally those post harvest treatments were effective but was not complete and there was some insect left so after that we uh, recommend we spray the marathon and safari for millibug and scale and aphid and sell three different ants uh, products and you can see the decrease in the millibug infestation but it was not as effective for aphid and not much for scale and ants also so because of that uh, the first wash and second wash uh, didn't result in the complete control but this was the uh, first year of uh, uh, try and we repeated that in the second year so this is a 2019 data somehow the aphids and scale and ant uh, numbers seemed low 2019 we don't know that's because of the we are using the pesticide repeatedly or or it's just seasonal differences but anyway that didn't uh, resulted in the anyway the, the wash and the hot water treatment didn't result in complete control but after treating with the contours uh, we used the contours to better control aphid so you can see the aphid was better controlled compared to the eight, uh, 2019 18 and 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 liver was still well, well controlled and scale and ants seems also a little bit lower and probably because of that the general lower levels insect the the post harvest treatment is effective enough to get the complete control so this means that if you use like proper combinations of the pre and post harvest treatment that maybe we can get the, achieve the very clean product in, at least for the uh, for cut flowers so this is the cost of the pesticide we used uh, in 2018. Uh, it was two, over $2,000. Uh, that's because the, the grower was kind of using pesticide first time and they didn't want to spray a lot. So we recommended granular foam, which is marathon granular, was pretty expensive. Uh, in the second year, we replaced that with contours, much, much cheaper. So it costed about $600. And the, the measuring productivity was not initially planned in the project, but so we didn't compare some part of treated and some part of the field not treated, and we didn't compare the productivity that way. But we could get the uh, total flowers produced per month from the growers, and you can see generally from 2017 to 19 the production increased. Uh, that could be also because of the maybe year to year variation or that could be also because you start killing insects so more resources going to the flowers than the, the insects so that's probably the case so we could see the increase in the flower production after treatment and grower is very happy because she doesn't need to spend a lot of time to hand washing the flowers anymore so I think this is uh, good for for cut flower industry in this way for for orchid is a little different story so we already knew that thrips are uh, pretty bad at developing resistance to many many different kinds of insecticide and before treatment uh, this shows that uh, untreated uh, orchid infested on the flower and spray almost 100 percent was infested to thrips and the, i think most of thrips were melon thrips so this is results from pylon treated orchids and pylon is supposed to be like most effective at this time but it was still not very effective after one week you still have 66 percent spray infested and after second week you get 81 percent 
And this is another trial with a pylon, uh, it seems worse. And this is with another pesticide, Avid, not, uh, not good. And this is with a combination of three different products and, and not very good. And we did notice that after uh, it was harvested in the farm and when it developed to the shipper, uh, when the truck ride kind of reduced the <laughs> strip level. So we don't know what's going on there, but maybe that can be used as a post-harvest treatment. And this is a 2018 to 19 summary. So basically all summarized together and there's not much differences before and after uh, pesticide treatment. Uh, we did see the truck effect again that and maybe we, maybe I have to look at those. But, but since there's no post harvest treatment for thrips, uh, that can be used. But I'm also looking at some fumigation uh, options, and, and I'll show some data later in my talk. And, but the, but the thrips is also pre harvest problem. It it reduces the flower production, so growers do need some uh, some something to treat the thrips before harvest, and that's why we want to still keep looking at the new chemicals. And slugs were easy to control with the methaldehyde. So, so this shows, suggests that there's some more work needs to be done in terms of the orchid uh, pest control. And, and I will talk about the foliage survey now. So this was done only in 2019, mainly because it was really hard to recruit the foliage growers to this project. And especially the large growers were initially saying that they want to participate, but later they backed out. Right? Anyway, uh, green pot, no. Pacific Flora Exchange has small scale foliage uh, operation for cut foliage. And, and they were kind enough to share their treatment schedule, which was alternation of the Melathion and Merit and Telstar basically, and, and I think this was pretty effective for so, so this is the tea leaves and dracaena and rapis palm was pretty clean for the scale and millibox, and phoenix palm and arisa palm has little more uh, millibox and scales, but those were effectively, were, could be effectively cleaned with the hot water treatment and, and washing. So I'll switch gear a little bit and talk about a little bit about this problem. So you can see that this inspector, maybe from Hawaii, is looking at you know, from California, looking at Hawaii very carefully, because probably she already know that the product from Hawaii may have some insect pests. So if I'm the inspector and if I know some products may have pests already, and if I don't see pests, maybe I'll, I'll check that again, right? And, and that's exactly probably happening there. And that's why we are getting more rejections. And so the, I think the only way to improve this situation is to produce better, clean crops and ship those. And, uh, and so, so maybe hopefully this can help. And I, I think like avoiding California market, not shipping to California is not a sustainable solution because California didn't start inspection from the start, so there's no guarantee that other states follow the, the path that California took. And also uh, avoiding California market with open, um, open, like, open market to the market access to the other competitors like, like Taiwan, Thailand, and Singapore. So that's not sustainable. Another thing I want to mention is that uh, I mentioned that this may be misleading, the one rejection per grower per year. And so this figure shows that the x-axis is the number of the rejections that a grower got over five years. So you can see there's like 0 to 10, 10 to 20, and someone got from 250 to 260, right? So most of the growers are already doing pretty good job. So, so so they get about less than two rejections per year. The problem is these growers with larger uh, rejections, but the rejection data doesn't show that rejection is based on how many shipments. So this 
260 rejections or could be from 300 shipment or could be from 1 million shipment. And that says very different things. And until, un, until we look at what is the real problem, uh, we cannot, like, I think, help them to figure out this problem. So hopefully and none of the growers will actually belong to these groups. So none of the growers that I work with together belongs mm -hmm. to this group. So hopefully I can work with some of the growers in this side. So summary so far. So I think the cut flower and foliage probably can be effectively cleaned using proper systems approach. It is important to use, apply the treatments very carefully to get the maximum effect you can get. Uh, for orchids, uh, it's a thrips control is a challenge, so, so we want to look at some more chemicals. Uh, but if the chemical is not enough, uh, we probably need to look at some uh, some post-harvest options, and I'm looking at some fumigation treatments, uh, especially acyl formate. Uh, this is a methyl bromide alternative. It's probably the, uh, the safest, no, it's probably the safest uh, fumigant available right now. It's uh, in, in the food and it's in the like beer, so it's, it's, it's good. So it's known to be very effective for thrips and aphid, and also effective for surface pests like mealybugs and scales. Uh, some of us was got invited to Korea by the, the Korean aphids last year, and they showed us some commercial uh, facility to treat uh, their imported banana using the ethyl formate. So those uh, banana crates going into that room or under these tents, very big tents, there's like about 20 of those in a, in a single room. And this all treated with the ethyl formate to control millibox and scales. So one of my collaborators in California also developing ethyl formate fumigation for oranges to uh, treat the red, red, I think red scale and some weevils for export. And I'm actually working on some uh, fumigation project uh, on cough flower from different states. This is uh, Alaskan peony. So we got some test grant for to do that, uh, me and, 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 and other uh, scientists in areas in California and Washington State University and, and uh, Alaska, Hawaii, uh, Alaska Department of Agriculture. And, and Hawaii is the only, pl uh, no, Alaska is the only place can produce uh, cut peony during the summer months. So although their uh, industry is very small, like two or three million dollars, but there's uh, some, a lot of interest. And these peonies have about 13 species of thrips problem. And we could do some uh, initial uh, treatment last year uh, in the field, and that seemed pretty effective. And we also did some uh, orchid uh, fumigation in the lab. And this was done by my previous postdoc, Myung Ho Lee. And, and this is the flowers that treated with the ethyl formate. One is not, and one is treated. And this is after seven days. And I don't know, some people get it right, and some people get it wrong. But the first one is not treated, and second one is treated. So seems like this is pretty promising. Uh, like I think phytotoxicity is pretty specific to species and, and cultivars of the orchid, so we need to uh, plant, so we need to look at more carefully, but seems like pretty promising. So I think we will be continuing this project another round, and the fumigation will be a part, especially for thrips, and also we will do the screening of new chemicals to thrips and other insects, and this was supposed to be done by Robert Keating, who just left. So we need to figure out who might want to do this. And, and I will also continue to work with other growers to improve systems approach. And hopefully, we can recruit some of the larger, larger foliage growers for this project. So with that, oh, so this was the questionnaire uh, that we did. Uh, we surveyed the growers after uh, another sem after at the on another seminar, and basically, I think about more than eighty percent of growers was feel confident after the seminar that they they could p probably reject lower rejections, and also seventy percent of the growers was interested in participating in this.
future research. So hopefully that goes well. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and thanks my funding agencies and collaborators from AFIS, USDA, University, and ARS, and, and all my grower collaborators, and especially Dr. Arnold Hara, and Nikki did all the survey and, and summarized all the data for me. So thank you. <laughs>